Hello, YouTube. Um, as you can see, I have actually uh, changed um, the name of the YouTube channel to In Christ Recovery and Apologetics. Um, and, you know, the focus is going to be mainly on uh, recovery and, uh, you know, growth and discipleship and things of that nature. And uh, tonight we have my friend and mentor, um, Chris Craft. And man, I want to tell you um, just about anything that I've learned on communication has been from listening to Chris or the resources that he has uh, told me to look into. So um, one of those. Be careful. Would... be careful. I can't be blamed for all that. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know, Chris, can you can you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, why you have such a heart for people, you know? Would love to, dude. Would absolutely love to. YouTube, I'm Chris Kraft. Um, I am, Sean and I met, my gosh, how many years has it been now? 2015, in a 2015, I'm sorry. 2015 is when you started CLF? Yes. Awesome. So, my, uh, just to go back a little bit further, my wife, Laura, and I, we, um, so we met at Southeastern University getting our college degrees. And um, and we'll yeah, we'll get more into that later, but um, we finished our college degrees, moved back to Alabama. We 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 were youth pastors for about thirteen years, and I recently stepped down from that position because it was just time it was time for somebody else to step in and go. <clears throat> and then over the last eight years, nine years actually, nine years this past Sunday, Sean was actually my first Sunday at CLF was nine years ago today. So <clears throat> so it's pretty pretty cool little anniversary there that Laura and I first came. So we came to Christian Life Fellowship in Calera as youth pastors and fell in love with the recovery community. I've never worked with anybody in recovery before until that. And we started to help out with the teenagers of people who were walking through recovery. And I fell in love with, with our pastor's vision for helping hurting people. He said, hurting people hurt people, but at the same time, they need a place to go. They need a sanctuary. They need a safe place where they can feel accepted and loved and feel the love of Christ and the acceptance of Christ. So that's what Mark started. That's what Mark and Lorna started. And that's what the atmosphere of our church has been ever since. And uh, I love it. And I told Mark up front, I said, I, I love the atmosphere and I love the vision. I love where you're taking the church. <clears throat> and so, but when it comes to loving people, you ask that specifically, I'll tell you this. Um, I have always loved leadership development, leadership development, personal development. I've always been a big reader. I've always, I love public speaking. In fact, I didn't know what I wanted to do at college. So people told me, they said, hey, Chris, you're a good public speaker and you're a Christian. That means you you got to be a pastor. I'm like, well, and I didn't know any better at that point. So I just followed their advice, went and got a degree in, what was my degree in church ministries with an emphasis in pastoral. That was the name of my degree. And today it comes to the point to where I just tell people I've got a communications degree. <laughs> like, like, yes, I studied Romans. Yes, I studied Corinthians. Yes, I've got all these biblical studies behind me. But when it comes down to it, like, what did I learn the most? I learned communication. And I married my wife, which was the best thing that happened to me while I was there. But in all that, I love, my, my goal has always been to help develop people. There is potential inside of everybody. And I heard a statement one time. It said, uh, everybody has greatness inside of them. And the best mentors and coaches don't duplicate themselves. Like, my goal is not to create Sean Gregory into Chris Kraft. My goal is to uncover the greatness that's inside Sean Gregory and shine that light, shine a light on that for the world to see. And so the kingdom of God, it can be for his glory. It can be for your good, but it's the greatness that he put inside of you. We were created in God's image and that creates greatness inside of us. And uh, so I, I love helping people develop themselves by any means necessary. Not me being the magic, but me helping point people to the right places. So that's why I love people. I love helping them develop. I love, I love watching people like you who walk in and I meet them and they have no self-confidence. And I didn't, I played such a small part in your life. Like I appreciate the fact that you give me some kind of credit. You're a, you're one of the most hungry students I've ever seen in my life. So when you walked in, you're like, I want to grow. I want to, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm not growing enough. I got to learn more. I got to read more. Like that's any teacher, any coach, that's what they want. They want hungry students like that. So props to you for being that hungry, but I just love seeing people grow, dude. That's my favorite thing in the world. 
You know, Pastor Mark, I, I remember one of the statements that, uh, well, one of the main statements that he actually makes there at the church, the church was founded to help those people that fall through the crowd, cracks, so to say, you know, and, uh, and I see that. I see people come in that are broken, that, you know, that have relapsed four or five different times, man, and they come in and it's just like, man, the love that the body of Christ shows there. Um, and, and we have mentors like you that are pouring into us, you know, it's, um, so that, that basically goes both ways, you know, um, it does. <laughs> let me ask you, so how much of that degree do you actually use? <laughs> okay. So up front, I found my wife there, so I use it every day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll kind of throw out this, um, you mentioned the idea that you wanted to do a podcast and your question kind of leads into that. So I'll kind of throw this out there. You, you, you really wanted to talk about the idea of education and self-education versus traditional education, all this. And you, you mentioned the idea of your question specifically is how much of that do I use? I would say I use a lot of it for the simple fact that any education we learn in our lives goes into our conscious mind and our subconscious mind. So I think I use that education all the time because it becomes part of who we are, right? So anything we learn, we won't go into this now, but the little hidden secret behind social media and all the amount of stuff that we're tying, tying into these days, we're getting educated. Oh yeah, We're getting brainwashed, <laughs> right? So yeah. basically the way I see college is it's a different kind of brainwashing. You're educating yourself. You're paying someone else to educate you in a certain direction. And I did, and they did. And I'm very thankful. For, I've got two college degrees, actually. I've got an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. Super thankful for both. But as we've talked about before, um, anybody who stops learning when they're in college or in, in school, they're basically saying, oh, I've learned everything I need for life by 18 years old or by 22 years old. So I, I, I'm glad I didn't stop at college because I do use the college degree still quite a bit, but uh, not as much as most people might think. I, I don't know if you've heard this statistic or not, but the current, the last time I heard is it's about 72 to 74% of people who graduate with a college degree will never get a job in the field of their degree. I've heard that. Yep. <laughs> so so I, I was never paid for my position because I didn't want money. Laura and I use it as a volunteer basis. Um, so we were never paid salaries or anything like that. So I would fall into that 72 to 74% because I never was paid a salary or even an hourly wage based on my degree. So I still use it, but this is what I'll say. I use the knowledge. I don't use the degree. Yeah. That may be a better way to say it. Yeah. And, and, you know, um, I'll tell you, you know, the, the seminary that I've been attending, you know, I, I really, I, I really enjoy my old Testament three, um, class because, you know, his, his, um, I'm trying to find the word, his, um, attempt was to teach us critical thinking, not, not teaching us what or how to think, so to yes. say, it's it's uh you know, well how to think critically but not like what to think you know he's he's not saying this is specific because so like whenever you're doing a paper in a seminary it's you know it's not it's not uh yes or no answers when you're doing that paper it's not hey your paper has to say something specifically like this you can you can go completely against the grain but what they're going to yep. be looking at is you know, is he is is this person putting thought into what they're writing? Are they are they thinking this thing out? I mean, it could be completely wrong. I mean, even probably to the point that it's heretical in a sense. But you're gonna get you're gonna get the grade for it because you're thinking these things out. You know, um, so, yeah, that's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, um, I've 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 got a little um, wall mural over here. It's one of my favorite. It says the best teachers teach their students where to look, not what to see. And I thought that's a really good way to put it. It's almost like an archer that's pulling back an arrow and they point at a certain place. 
but the potential is in the arrow that's not in the archer. So it's pretty cool. So, yeah. So like one of the, one of the main things, and you just said it uh, earlier, um, whenever I started, you know, attending uh, Celebrate Recovery and I, you would speak at the church uh, was, is, you know, I don't want to teach somebody how to be me, so to say, I want them, I want to pull out the potential that that person actually has. No doubt. And, and I'll say this, you know, um, you know, and, and I, I know you would agree is that, you know, you know, Christ is a definition of what uh, is uh, in our identity is found in Christ, you know, mm -hmm. but we also, we also bring these personalities, these characteristics and things which should be submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ. But you do have these character, you have these talents that could be used for the kingdom of God. Would you say that that's a good way to put that? Yeah, I actually heard you say that in your last YouTube video, and I thought that was great because we do bring our own personality traits. And here's the thing. I've heard both extremes. I've heard one extreme that says, well, God created us and he wants us to be exactly like him. Bury your personality, bury your talents. He wants you to be exactly him. And I've heard the other extreme, somebody that says, hey, he created us and I'm going to be totally myself. But I like how you said that. I bring my personality traits. I bring my gifts, submit them to the Lordship of Christ. And what does he help? Because let, let's be honest, he created us with the gifts. He created us with the personality. He created us with the with with all this stuff that was not tainted by sin. We were we were born here and it was tainted by sin. But it's so it's the idea of who I am, God put in me. So he wants me to maximize the person he put on this planet for his purposes. He put me here for a reason and he doesn't. And I I heard Chris Brady say this this week. He said, my greatest fear is that I'm going to give my gifts back to God unused. And I said, that's a well, well said, right? Because I don't want to give my gifts back to God. Well, used. he gave gifts to me. I heard somebody say one time that golf clubs are made to be put in the dirt. <laughs> like a pretty golf club is one that's never been used. Yeah. It's got chinks, it's got chips, it's got, you can tell it's been used. Like a book that has earmarks and that is completely written up and underlined, you can tell has been studied, right? Yeah. Like books that sit on the shelf, you got to blow the dust off of, that's not a well-used tool. So I want to give my gifts back to God used, man. My piece is coming off of it and handles got to be taped. <laughs> like, I want to <laughs> give God my gifts used. So, yeah, I totally agree with you, dude. We do have to bring everything under the submission of Christ. But at the same time, we can't just say, well, hands off. I don't have any personal responsibility in the matter. So there's a balance in the middle there for sure. Oh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, you, you get a, a you get the hypers. I mean, you know, on either side, it's like you get the hypers of, uh, of hey, you know, it's I mean, we could even liken it to, you know, predestination and free will, you know, the Calvinist Arminian debate in that sense, you know, you get the hypers on either side. And I think that there is that, uh, there is that moderate because, you know, I mean, man is responsible for his choices, you know, our choices do matter, you know? Um, so I, I, w I would definitely agree with that. And, uh, so I'm getting off on a tangent. No, so, so, let me bring us back because it actually because it actually fits in something you said earlier, because when it comes to extremes, when it comes to all this kind of stuff, you made a statement earlier that was really good. You said college is actually more for the idea of teaching critical thinking, and you're exactly right. And that's what a lot of us have to understand when it comes to college, when it comes to what I'm going to call traditional education. It means the traditional education of the world today is you go to school, you go to elementary school, high school, you graduate, and we're told go to school, get good grades, get a good, safe, secure job, and you'll be fine. And usually by school, they mean college, right? It's kind of a given today that college, college you just need to go to college. I completely disagree with that. I'm very thankful for college. I'm a big proponent of going to college if there's a reason. I had a friend of mine who is now a registered nurse that works down in Alabaster. Super thankful he went to college to figure out how to do what he does, right? Some yeah. professions necessitate college necessitate more traditional education but not everyone there are some people like i love that let me just throw this out into the world here right 
Sean Gregory is one of the hardest workers I know, like with his hands, with his, like I tossed out something to church to him and I'm like, hey, here's a project I need. He's like, oh, I can do this, 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 this. I'm like, I'm a computer nerd. I got a day job sitting in an office or right now sitting in my home because it's COVID, but I, I'm, I'm a computer nerd. So when it comes to working with hands, so every single person doesn't need the traditional education model. And the reason you wanted me to come in here is because one of my passions is self-education. Yeah. Because, and part of college is supposed to teach how to learn, how to think, right? Especially high school. High school, we should be learning some critical thinking. We should be learning how to determine between two different courses of action. We should be thinking how to learn how to think for ourselves. But very often what we're taught is to memorize this list of whatever and regurgitate it on a test and we never remember it again. We're not really learning critical thinking or how to learn. So I love that you mentioned that earlier because that really is what this ties into whether it comes to my college or your seminary, the real goal is to learn critical thinking and to learn the process of how to learn. You know, one of the one of the uh, first, well, I wouldn't say the first things, but one of the things that I've actually uh, learned from you is that um, someone, everyone is uh, my superior in some way, you know? And, and, and from that, I can learn from them. Yeah, and I can learn from that specific person something that i do not know or yep. that i can get better at you know and excel yep. at in in an area now i'll tell you one of the one of the most helpful things that's uh, that has helped me learn and to remember certain things is note taking i think that that is something that is real big i mean you know <laughs> you come in sunday morning in our church what are you going to see you're going to see a sea of people with notebooks in hand writing it down because they've learned that from you and Brian, you know, and uh, for y'all that don't know, Brian Craft is uh, my best friend and mentor. So this is, uh, Brian is actually Chris's brother. So, mm -hmm. and um, I've learned so much from these guys, you know, um, and I just I, I love the fact that I can come with you guys. I can come to you guys with different opinions and it's not like shot down, you know, um, I mean, even different theological opinions. And you guys don't just like sweep it under the rug or like, oh, man, you're 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 coming at this completely wrong, you know, and it, you're 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 so supportive and, you know, we should see that within the body of Christ, right? We should see that someone growing and learning in that way. So note taking is one, but it's not, it doesn't just stop at note taking is it's looking over those notes and it's applying what you've learned, you know? Um, I, you know, what, what is the statistic on that, Chris? Isn't it like you remember, uh, 70 percent more of what you're actually hearing if you... yeah it's i i don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head but what i will tell you is that the scientific part of it is you remember a, a small percentage of what you hear you remember a lot let's just throw some numbers against the wall i don't know if this is real but it's something to the effect of you normally remember the average person remembers 10 percent of what they hear 30 percent of what they write 40 to 50 percent of what they write then reread Mm -hmm. Sometimes 60% if they write, reread, then repeat it out loud because then now they're hearing themselves say it. And you usually remember up to 80% if you turn around and teach it to someone else. See, <laughs> and I'll tell you this, man. Um, I, you know, I'll learn something in seminary or in um, the biblical counseling class that, mm -hmm. that I, I take. And I would apply it at one of the recovery meetings, like at Broken yep. Vessels or something. And I remember that class mm -hmm. better than yep. any other class because I actually wrote it down and said, you know what? I meditated on it. I was looking back over the notes and I taught it that night, that next night. Yes. And it just, it stuck with me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly so, right. Like, and, and something that I teach people a lot, a lot too, when it comes to taking notes, since you threw that out, 
is taking notes from someone who's speaking, especially a professor or a pastor or a coach or something like that. Like personally, I, when I'm on one-on-one -on -one Zooms with my coach, I have a notebook. When I go out to eat with my coach, I have a notebook, right? Because why? Because I want to soak in for the, the, the main reason, and I want everybody to hear this, I respect them. Like it may be weird in a culture where we don't really understand respect, but if I come into a church and I'm going to hear what the pastor has to say, first of all, I understand myself and I understand I've got a lot going on in my life. Like we all do, like every one of your listeners do. And we need to understand that we're going to be distracted by thought processes and everything else. So if I write down, it's a better way to focus, but I'm how, and you've spoken in front of people that have notebooks. Isn't, isn't it the best feeling in the world when you say a really good statement, you see everybody start writing it down you feel respected. So yeah. on the other side of it, if I bring my notebook, what I'm telling Sean Gregory is I respect you. What I tell Pastor Mark Davis is I respect you because I'm gonna want to learn something. I'm not just here to put a check mark in the box. I'm gonna be a hungry student. And that's what self-education is about, right? It's what personal development, that, that term has been, my opinion, that term has been taken by Satan and kind of made into this self-help new age genre that's out there. But the simple phrase personal development simply means taking the gifts and talents God gave me and making, making them better, becoming more valuable. Like I tell Sean this all the time. I, there's no way that the person I was seven or eight years ago could have coached you along like I have been, or like Brian Kraft. You should have seen him seven or eight years ago, but he reads. He listens to his mentors. He associates with the right people. Therefore, he can feed into you. But many of us have a very selfish mindset about, well, I'm just going to put my check mark in the box. I'm not worried about who's speaking or whatever else. I'm just going to come in and leave. If you're the last one to arrive and the first one to leave, then what you're telling the person is, I'm just here to put a check mark in the box. That's just something to keep in mind. But if you're the first one there and you're the last one to leave, now you're you're telling them, I value you i value this association so just to throw that out there. i 100 percent agree and and you know recovery brothers and sisters i want you to hear this um you continue to hear associations 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 and it is about your associations what is what is the three p's or or the two p's and the one t it's people places things right so if we can check Let's say that we're 30 days sober, whatever, you know, um, we we need to be reevaluating the people that we are associating with. Right. We need to be we need to be reevaluating the places that we're going. And I guarantee you, you knock out those two keys, the things are going to be left behind. They really are. You're not going to you're not going to be associating with those people or those places for you to be able to get those things, which is a.k.a. substances alcohol, things of that nature. You're not going to be going back to that. You're going to, and, and, you know, if you don't have a church body, get in a church body and surround yourself with a loving church body, because I, you know, I, I 100% believe that God is sovereign within this whole, um, within this whole, uh, you know, my recovery process. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, I, he placed me at CLF and, and, you know, one of the first things, and I'll, I'll say this, one of the first things is it, it is a mental challenge. I heard this when Christelle gave her uh, testimony the other night, right? And it was such a great testimony at Living Recovery. Um, and she started saying the mental toughness that came from it. And, and what, what, that, what that entails is like um, conflict. And when I think of that, I think of, I think of, this false reality and false paradigm that I held so tight within my substance abuse. I had all these false truths. And I remember you saying this is that how are we going to renew our minds? Um, what, what we need to do is, is we need to pour new information in so that that old information can come out. And it's a constant feeling of new information. Mm -hmm. You got to constantly be pouring. Can you elaborate on that uh, 
a I little love bit. You, dude. Like you're 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 hitting on my hot spots. Yeah. <laughs> like the, these are things I'm passionate about because here's here's uh, here's the here's the way the process works, right? And you can look anywhere. This is not Chris Craft making this up. You can look anywhere in in the world. You can look in the world of sports. You can look in we're in the middle of divisional playoffs for NFL. It doesn't matter where you look. You see in success principles or success principles. And why? Because there's only one eternal one. And that's that's God. That's God the Father himself. So if God creates a principle, it's going to be a principle in whatever avenue, whatever genre you put it in. Sports, business, family, church. It's going to be a principle. Here's one of the principles. You can't change results without changing the things that created the results. Remember the law of the so of the uh, of this of the sower, right? What is the parable of the sower? Whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. So a lot of us are seeing the results we have in our lives. I'll give you a really shallow example here. I'm overweight. I'm trying to lose weight. So I've taken a couple of drastic steps to change my results. But here's the deal. Here's the here's the way the process works. The results we currently have are the end of this cycle. I'm going to kind of create a cycle here. I wish I could like print it on PowerPoint presentation, right? So it's the results down here. But what creates our results? It's our actions. The actions that we take on a daily basis is what creates our results. So what do I want to do with my weight? Well, I'm going to change my actions. Here's the problem. That's not the beginning of the cycle. What creates our actions? It's our thinking. I've heard it said recently, we're all worth minimum wage from the neck down. It's what we put in our head that makes us worth and valuable more to our employees, to our customers, or however that is. So it's our thought process that creates our actions, which creates our results. So Chris, I need to change my thinking. Okay, well, how do I do that? It's the first step of the process. It's your inputs. It's the things you read, the things you listen to, and the people you associate with that create your inputs. Those things create your thinking. Your thinking creates your actions. Your actions create your results. So let's think about this. Chris wants to lose weight because the results say that he's a fat guy, right? And I just want you to follow this. I want to change my actions, my habits. Cool. I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to do all this stuff. That's great. I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to start lifting weights. Ooh, here's the problem. You know, a thought process I've always struggled with. I'm a fat guy. It's who I am. It's my identity. So I don't care who you are. If your thinking has you secure, and I love your talk last week on YouTube that talks about, am I an addict or am I a new creation? If you haven't heard that, go back and listen to that. Because here's, and again, I've been working with the recovery community. I highly respect everyone's opinions on if you if you want to say that you're an addict, that and that's part of your program, I'm not putting that down in the least. But this is what I'll tell you. If your thought pattern is that I'm an addict, I'm an addict, I'm an addict, I'm an addict, then you can change the activities all you want to, but your results will never stick as much as they could if you change the thought pattern to 2 Corinthians 5 that says I'm a new creation. But Chris, I didn't know that information. You're right, because you don't have the inputs yet. Change your inputs, which changes your thinking, which changes your daily actions, which changes your results. That's what Sean was talking about when it comes to how do I get the new information in? Read, listen, associate. Let's cover those real quick. Read. Well, Chris, I'm not a reader. I know. I can tell by your results. I hate to be, I hate to be blunt, right? But somewhere in the mid 80% of Americans will not finish a book this year. Yet the top CEOs in the world finish 60 books in a year. The people that we usually highly respect are readers. Leaders are readers in general. Reading is how we get new information in. I want you to think about it this way. Let me just, I, I actually grabbed several. Um, this book, Personality Plus, this is one of the first ones that I gave to Sean. And I wanted to help him understand if you could better understand that your wife is not wrong, she's different. You could give her grace instead of being frustrated all the time. You could understand her difference. Florence Litauer studied personalities for years and years and years, and she put all of her wisdom into a 200-page book that even a slow reader can read in two months. So here's my question. Do you think that your life is going to be better or worse taking 20 years of knowledge and inputting new, positive, principle-driven information into your mind? How are our relationships going to be worse if I'm inputting good, new information? Well, Chris, how do I... How, 
I, I don't know what to read. Do I go into books a million and just like any, mini miny mo? Please don't. <laughs> Please don't just go randomly. And don't take a random book for suggestion from somebody you know. It's funny, the people that have the most stress, the most fear, and the most worry in their lives tend to want to give me their book suggestions. I'm like, that's fine. I appreciate your opinion. But the people I'm going to go to are the people I respect and I want their results the most. I'm going to go to them and I'm going to ask them. So go to someone you respect. Go to someone you respect and say, hey, Sean, maybe start with Sean. Start with Brian. My brother, Brian, is one of the best readers I know. If you want a good book suggestion, go to him, Pastor John Trahan. Our whole staff at CLF, we're readers. We're studiers. And I think it's one of the reasons we get along so well. So reading is one way to get information in. Here's another one, listening. And I tell people, well, and people ask me all the time, well, do audiobooks count? Those don't count for reading. Audiobooks count under the listening category. Why? Because the brain learns differently when you're reading something on a page or a tablet than it does when you're just listening. Why? Because you read words in your voice. It changes everything when you read words in your voice. So what Laura and I do is something called net learning, N-E-T. That stands for no extra time learning. What does that mean? When I'm doing the dishes, I have an audio playing. I've got a podcast. When I'm in my car, my car is university on wheels, right? <laughs> like I'm learning in the car all the time. I'll be playing a video game over here and I'll have an audio playing in the background. Why? So my subconscious can catch it. So learning is another way to get new information and that you touched on this earlier. The most, and I, Laura and I have been part of the recovery community now for nine years studying watching them being part of their lives. I have not seen one person, please hear me, everybody that's listening, I have not seen one person leave a recovery program, go back to their old association and succeed the way they truly wanted to. Not one. Your association will determine where you go. <clears throat> so I've seen way too many people that'll come into my sister's place complete a nine month program and think I'm okay now. So they leave our church and they head back to their old association and two months down the road, I see them wherever. Read, listen, associate. That's the three inputs to change your thinking, to change your actions, to change your results. And dude, here's the crazy part. You asked me, hey, Chris, where did you learn that? Not at college. I learned that through self-education by finding mentors and coaches and asking them, how do I keep learning? How do I, I want to keep learning? Because as soon as you stop learning, you have nowhere to go but down. So I've been talking a minute. I'll kind of let you, no. <laughs> I'll let you come back to this. No, no, that's I, I good. Can I am so passionate. About this. I can talk about it forever. I know. And, 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 and that's good because, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that the viewers need to hear this, you know? Um, yeah. So Chris, uh, you know, you told me a little bit, um, about your story, why you started, uh, digging in so much into, uh, you know, you, you felt, you felt called to be a speaker. Uh, what, what, what was it that, uh, made you take that step? If you can elaborate on that a little bit, like to step out and to find certain mentors. A good question. No, it's a good question. And some of your listeners may be going through that, right? Because there's a lot of people in the world today that they're, they feel like they need to pull the trigger on something, but a lot of time fear holds them back, right? So I found myself um, several years ago praying for open doors of opportunity because what I noticed in my life was high stress everywhere I was at, high stress in my finances. My marriage has always been good. But I was even having stress there because I, I found myself responding negatively to my wife. I'm like, I, why am I, res I love my wife. I even like her. <laughs> why, why am I responding this way? So I started finding all these areas of stress. And, and I thought, you know, let me look for something else. Let, let, let me look for something else in my career. I, I don't know. And I started praying for open doors of opportunity. Tell me again what you changed the name of your podcast to be. In Christ. In Christ Recovery and Apologetics. In Christ, recovery, and apologetics. Here's the deal. If you're in Christ, 
and you've ever experienced recovery or you're walking through recovery, and if you even know what apologetics is, right, then you're plugged into right information. I found myself not plugged in to right information. Let me share this principle with you. If you want, if you don't want what 95% of people have, you got to quit listening to the media of 95% of people. Does that make sense? Yeah. I found myself wanting a 5% marriage, 5% finances. Like I wanted, I, it wasn't that I wanted what somebody else has. I wanted what I didn't have. I wanted financial independence. I, I wanted a better marriage. I wanted more purposeful meaning. And that may be where some of your listeners are. The first thing I'm going to tell you is you can't sit here and listen to what 95% of people say and get 5% results. It's not even possible. 95% inputs are going to create 95% thinking, which is going to create 95% action and 95% results. So you've got to change the media. We're in a media war, right? You've got the forces of light versus the forces of darkness. And we think that keeping tuning into the forces of darkness is going to create this lifestyle of light. How does that work? So what I found myself is I found myself wanting this 5% lifestyle of a better life, giving more glory to God, bringing more people into his kingdom. But I found myself constantly plugged into this media. So I started praying, God, open up doors of opportunity. You know what he told me? I, it's like, I remember this. I remember where I was sitting when I remember him telling me this. He said, Chris, I'm opening up the doors. You're just too scared to walk through them. Wow. <laughs> oh, dang. I was developing fear in my life by what I was reading, social media, listening to, and the people I was associating with. And that's not a dig on anybody I was associating with. I was taking in too much of the wrong information into my life. So a big difference in my life when I decided, you know what, I'm gonna take a stand, I'm gonna chase something that I wanna do, is called immersion. I decided to immerse my, I decided to turn off the 95%, and people thought I went a little fanatical, right? I didn't, I, um, I've, heard, I've recently heard the phrase, say no to the scroll, right? If you're going to go on social media, go search it. Don't scroll because you're just going to, you're going to, it's like you're wasting your time, right? So I said no to the scroll. I turned off my, I turned off my Facebook. I, I turned off my social media. I quit playing so many video games. I started plugging into books like this, The DNA of Relationship by Gary Smalley. Yeah. And I didn't just read them. I studied them. We put notes. We marked up the books. I started listening to packs like the conflict resolution pack to where I could, like, I could learn how to resolve conflict in my marriage. I started digging into stuff like the financial fitness program. And my wife and I have eliminated $130,000 of our debt in the last five years. Amazing. <laughs> but but here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I hear two things that a lot of people say. Wow, Chris, you're so good. No, I'm not. I turned off 95% media and through self-education, I immersed myself. What does immerse mean? It means if I'm going to immerse a cookie in my coffee, I dunk it completely under. I immersed myself with books like the 4-8 Principles by Tommy Newberry. Yes, I have these ready sitting next to me, but it's fun. If you want a book on how to change your thinking, Based on the Bible, 4-8 Principles, fantastic. If you're an entrepreneur and interested in entrepreneurship, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. It's about business ownership and how entrepreneurs really get started. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I started reading these books. I read this book every year for six years straight. Every year. Why? Because it teaches you simple principles like smile. <laughs> I wasn't smiling and then wondering why people were frustrated. I'm a six foot seven, 300 pound guy who didn't smile. <laughs> people didn't really like being around me. So I'm learning principles like this. This book changed my life. Rich Dad, Poor Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant teaches how money's made in America. It's not a Christian book, but it's a self education book that taught me principles on finance. Leadership and self deception radically changed my life. Amazing so, book. So, so, <laughs> so that's, that's the answer to your question. What, what sparked it? Immersion in self-education and personal development sparked by the word of God. Again, if I'm going to create a house, I have to have a foundation that I build on the foundation. And Jesus said, no other foundation. There is no other foundation other than Jesus, 
himself. Personality plus does not come before the Bible. Financial fitness, no matter all the debt paid off, great, does not come before biblical principles, right? So lay the foundation, which is Christ. And then I decided to build a life based on principles, principles that don't change, success principles that people apply in every area of their life that agree. Most of them are biblical principles. You know, the number one principle in this, quit owing people like the Bible says. <laughs> this, was, this was one of the basic principles, right? Conflict resolution. Start learning how to get along with people like Jesus did, right? So when it comes to in Christ, apologetics and recovery and all these things, you know what? Immerse yourself in the lifestyle that you want. And I'm not talking about wealth and riches and all that. Fine. If you want that, immerse yourself in that. Go for it. But what I'm going to tell you is immerse yourself in Scripture. One of the things things I respect Sean the most about you is how much you immerse yourself in scripture. <clears throat> you, you're never satisfied with the way that you are. You're constantly wanting to get better. It's like, man, I used um too much in that podcast. I got to get better at that. Like you're constantly wanting to learn and grow, <clears throat> but I'm going to go back to this point. Any one of your listeners that think that they can immerse themselves in 95% or let's, let's change it for our recovery brothers and sisters. If you think that you can immerse yourself in 95% of substance abuse, of reading, listening, and associating with people who are doing the same, you will never reach a true 5% lifestyle of recovery and a true God-honoring life. It's not possible. The laws of success that govern this world don't work that way. So if you truly want to change, and again, you don't have to do this. I am not your boss. <laughs> I am not your dad. And Sean Gregory in general is probably not your boss either. So he's not going to tell you what to do. But this is what I tell people all the time. I'll, I'll use it in finances because we can laugh about this, right? I'll tell people, I I don't care. It doesn't hurt me if you don't get out of debt. If you don't get financial literacy, it doesn't hurt me at all. But you're not allowed to come whining to me about your finances because I've provided you a way out. Yeah. Is that fair? So what I tell people is if you're struggling with stress and fear and anxiety and worry, and Sean talks, starts talking about Matthew 6, 630 and 631 and 632, why do you worry about all the things that the heathens talk worry about? Why, why don't you know that God takes care of those that are his? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be taken care of. And then we still live in fear and stress and worry and anxiety. I, I kind of feel like Jesus is saying the same thing. You don't have to live free, but don't come whining to me. I've already told you how to live stress. Like I've, I've taught you how to do this. I love what Sean said. I'm going to go back to this at the very beginning. I'm handing it off to you so you can finish this up. Apply. Apply. What's the key of self? I would trade outside of my life. I would trade my entire college, two degrees, all my traditional education for the last four to five years of self-education that I've done. I have learned multiple times more information than I ever have through this process. Find a coach and a mentor that I respect and, and fruit check. I like the fruit they have in their lives. And then I ask them, what can I immerse myself in? If I turn off the other voices, would you give me books and audios that I can immerse myself in? I've done that and I love the results. So I hope that's some of what you wanted me to share, man. That's what was on my heart. And and, to, and to, specifically to my recovery brothers and sisters, you'll be shocked what will happen when you turn off the negative voices. You'll be shocked. Oh, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I, I love that song by Cats and Crowns, uh, oh. The Voice of Truth. You oh, know? Dude, it. that, it's amazing. And, and, you know, so it's like all your inputs, what, what are we inputting? You know, and... You heard Chris say, you know, the foundation needs to be Christ. It needs be. to be you immerse yourself in God's word. And um, honestly, within, you know, this postmodern uh, uh, church era that we have, you know, mm -hmm. the, the practical theology is lacking, guys. The practical being a witness and, and the proclamation of the gospel goes so much more than just 
professing with our mouths. It's by our actions, how we carry ourselves. It's, it's living it out and believing and walking in obedience to God's word, right? Um, I care much. You're right. Let me interrupt you real quick. I, I wish, and I think the Apostle Paul would say the same thing, I wish that instead of just knowing where Scripture is or what Scripture is, I wish people would live it out. I think from everything I've seen in Scripture, like what does James 1 say? Don't just be hearers of the Word. Don't just sit in the pew and listen to the pastor. Be doers. I totally agree with you. I'll say this, you know, and I've caught myself, um, you know, walking it out throughout the day and then coming home and getting short with my wife. What, what you know, my main missionary ground is here at home as a husband and as a father. That is my main missionary ground. You know, you, my walk in Christ doesn't stop when I leave work. My walk with Christ doesn't stop whenever I leave the house. So that goes both ways. I mean, I need to be, I need to be a light um, in a dark world uh, these days, guys. And I mean, that should be a constant call. You, you see that, and I'll say this, you know, with conflict, okay? And, and I was thinking about this the other day. Um, and any epistle that you see just about, I, I would say maybe, maybe not James, but um, you see grace and peace, especially in, uh, especially in uh, Paul's and then Peter, you see Peter, he, the emphasis is grace and peace at the beginning. So, and, and what I'm thinking of is yep. second, second Peter, uh, chapter one, uh, verse two, grace and peace, uh, through the, through the knowledge of God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep, you see going. that, look, in any conflict, you're going to see that, that the, main, uh, the main goal is reconciliation. I mean, that really is in any conflict that you have. Um, yep. I, wa I want to say that, but you see that someone, someone, guys, has to give grace so that peace may abound. Someone has to defer, and and you see that in uh, love and respect, right? He Eckridge talks about that 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 deferring, right? Um, and the more and the more, more mature one will defer. Yeah, the more and, mature one will defer. Hey, you know this is the whole thing with conflict. When you got two people button heads, guys, they both think they're right. They time. both they both think they're right. And it takes that, it takes the grace of God being poured in our hearts to say, okay, wait a minute, God's giving me grace. I'm going to give grace in this moment and I'm going to shut my mouth. <laughs> I'm, so glad, I'm so glad you said this. I'm not sure if you've seen this or not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the epistles starting in Galatians. And I know you probably need to end this because we can talk forever. Yeah. I'm going to read the last verse of every one of the epistles. Are you ready for this? Yes. Have you done this before? No. The last verse of Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Last verse of Ephesians. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Philippians. Uh, hold on. Oh, Philippians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Colossians. Um, remember my chains. Grace be with you. First Thessalonians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Second Thessalonians, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. First Timothy, grace be with you. Second Timothy, chapter four, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Are we starting to get the point? <laughs> <laughs> Paul ends. Every time you, every time that I left my dad when I was a kid, I would always hug him and say, I love you. Why? Because I wanted the parting words before we left to stick out in his mind. And guess what? My dad passed away 10 years ago, 2011. And I have, I'm, I'm one of the few people I believe that can say this. I have very few, if any, regrets on the way that my relationship with my dad was. And I also know this. I didn't get to see him right before he died. But I do know the last thing I said to him was, I love you. Because I left him with that every time. Why do I say that? Because the Apostle Paul left every one of his epistles with the one thing he wanted you to remember the most. Grace. Amen to that. 
guys. Um, hey, so Chris, <clears throat> when are you yes, going to start? When are you going to start YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> I would much rather be an honored guest on wonderful shows like this, and I go from there. But um, I, I, you can. Um, I'm currently on LinkedIn. I've, I've, I don't really post a lot on Facebook. If I, I did just did a podcast yesterday with a gentleman out of Massachusetts. It's on my Facebook page. So you can, if you want to go check out my Facebook, Sean and I are friends, if you want to connect that way. And, um, and you can feel free to email me. My email is jollygreencc at gmail.com. I don't mind throwing that out to the universe and seeing what happens. But, um, but yeah, if you want to email me, feel free. We can start a conversation. I love through COVID and this process. I have found high value in networking and getting to know people outside of my normal circle of influence. So um, I love meeting people and I love having conversations. So feel free to connect. Um, Chris, I, so what about the soapbox? I, I know that y'all are not doing any. You put me podcasts. on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I got, a, I got a lot out of the soapbox. So, and you know, it. Um, okay. So so yeah you, you can go to the soapbox you can get it through um apple Podcasts, through apple store or through um galaxy through android um micah davis and i did a podcast and we're going to get back to them we'll call it season two or something like that but through covid it's thrown off our schedule and i think next week we're actually scheduled to get them started again so i to be perfectly honest i forgot i forgot that was still out there so um, Micah Davis and I did podcasts on on thinking and on thought processes. He's got a degree in philosophy. I've got a degree in ministry, and we just we love having conversations. So we hit record and have conversations. So feel free to tie into that and anything you want to say about that too, Sean. Yeah, hey, I mean he he's got a lot of a uh, lot of good stuff on the soapbox. Um, it it does help with your thinking. And, and, you know, <laughs> I love Chris to death. I don't agree with everything that Chris says, you know. I but, hope not. You think for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, you know, man, he has helped me grow so much. And just with the with the thinking, you're, you're going to – guys, I just want to say this before we end. You, you are going to come, come across certain things that are going to challenge you in ways, you know. And – and any good mentor is going to do that. Any good mentor is going to challenge your thinking. And they're going to say, well, why do you think this way? Um, and they're not going to tell you how to think. They're, they're, they're going to say, well, why are you thinking this way? And that's one of Brian Kraft's favorite phrases is, why do you think that? Why do you yep. think that? And I'm like, well, why do you not? <laughs> because, I mean, I, Honestly, selfishly, I'm like, man, you need to be thinking the way that I do. <laughs> it's so That's, funny we all think that, but truthfully, if our mentors thought like we did, they would be pretty crappy mentors because they'd be on the same plane as we are. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, as Apostle Paul, um, Peter would say, you know, grace and peace be with you guys. Grace be with you guys.